you've got the right balance of EQ along with IQ and OQ, that's the sweet spot. Hi, I'm Duncan Pryor, digital transformation consultant and host of the Making Things Work podcast. I love looking for innovative and creative ways to make work better so that we can get the balance right in our lives and have seen how leadership and teams can accomplish that. In this podcast series, we meet a group of executive leaders to understand what leadership means to them and their approach to delivering transformation and change in the workplace so that teams achieve great things and people see their careers flourish. Today, we're talking to Ian Gillespie, a CEO in the healthcare sector. We're going to be talking today about how to activate businesses so that they can innovate and succeed in their market. Welcome, Ian. Thanks, Duncan. Nice to be here. So one of my favorite topics that we often talk about is when you talk about sort of staring at the numbers, when you really need to do something as a business, the temptation is to sort of look at numbers to try and find answers. And you very much go sort of counter to that. So can you just talk about that a little bit? It's very easy to be flippant whenever it comes to saying, well, look, analysis paralysis, you know, let's get on with it. And there's so many sayings about that, isn't there? Sort of, it's about you know, 10% preparation, 90% perspiration. You've got to be very careful. Of course, if you're a seasoned, experienced business guy, you can say those sort of things because you've got the toolkit under your belt. If you're somebody relatively inexperienced in a new role or you know, kind of trying to make it in business, yeah. you've got to be very careful with that because what, what I'm not saying is just get on with it and make stuff up. There are so many times in my career where I've seen people stare at spreadsheets for far too long. Yeah. The spreadsheet isn't going to give you the answer. What will give you the answer is in-depth analysis of what you're trying to achieve. So yeah. you know, don't ever take that first step forward without knowing anything. You're going to get that knowledge and experience. You're going to know what to do. You know, people talk about gut feel. Gut feel comes from talking to people, actually looking at the business, trying things without the arrogance of thinking that what you're trying the first go around is the right answer. There's very rarely a right answer. There's multiple right answers. So, you know, whenever I talk about analysis paralysis, what I'm saying is don't be afraid to do something. I think a lot of people think whenever I'm going on about, oh, get on with it. Let's stop looking at the spreadsheets. I'm sort of a bit of a cavalier business guy. I'm not. If you're buying a business or selling a business, then there's an absolute need yeah. to stare at the numbers because the numbers are going to give you a rich history. Once you've done your uh, analysis, then get out there, deal with people, talk with people, visit customers. You've got to do all those sort of things. As a leader, this is probably less true today than it was whenever I was starting out. But you know, a lot of people thought, I want a leadership role because I'm going to have a nice big office and I'm going to sit there yeah. you know, and make decisions and tell people what to do. Yeah, you couldn't be further from the truth. You know, I mean, great leaders are out there you know, doing it, leading by example. And again, that's a classic phrase that people use and people misunderstand it. You know? Yeah. If I'm out there leading by example, it doesn't mean I'm a better salesman than my sales director. You know, I'm not going to go out there and it's going to ruin a sales call by thinking that because I'm the chief executive, I'm going to do a better job than him. It's about going out and spending time with them and understanding kind of you know, what they're doing and how you can help and how you can bring the business forward using your skills and expertise in collaboration with or alongside the skills and expertise of the rest of your team. So then those numbers are the representation of the activities of the things you've done. And at some point you have to try these things out and see what works and what doesn't. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, the, the numbers are directional for me. Yeah. It helps you with the decision-making process, but the decision-making process itself should not be solely based on the numbers. You know, the, the analysis paralysis thing is a fact, but it's usually driven by inexperience. You know, if you yeah. don't know, or if it's, if it's a really hard decision, you know, sometimes... Yeah. You can be drawn back down to the bit of paper. You can make numbers say lots of different things. There's a real skill in that. So again, be careful if you're presented with a fait accompli from a set of numbers. You know, make sure you look at the numbers yourself and then ask yourself, well, what are they really telling me? Yeah. Because you can present a set of numbers to say, buy the business, don't buy the business, invest in this uh, opportunity, don't invest in this opportunity. Same set of numbers. You just have to manipulate them in a slightly different way. Interesting. Yes. So let's get into that a bit more then about how you activate your team, mobilize your leadership team 
Can we talk a bit more about how you do that, whether it's in sales or marketing or the operational side of the business? Yeah. How do you drive that forward? It's an interesting one. A lot of times I read, I listen to podcasts, in fact, about business and business leadership. And a lot of people have a very singular direction in terms of, here's how you should motivate people. Here's how you should lead a team. Here's, here's how you should kick off a new business. And you know, I'm, I'm the first to say I enjoy reading that, but I balance that with my experiences and I, I pick and choose the things that I think are relevant for me. So if, if you're an experienced business person, read a lot, listen to a lot, and pick out the stuff that you think, oh, that's interesting. Maybe I'll try that. Because there isn't one way. If you're an inexperienced person listening or, or reading about business leadership, again, use that as, okay, well, I'll try that next time and see if it works for you. Because I've been around lots of very good business leaders in my career, and they're not all the same. Yeah. You know, If there was to be one book, here's the book on how to lead and how to be a great CEO, there isn't. You've got to look at who you are as a person, what your experiences are, and then take the elements from what you're reading or listening to and apply it to you. For me, how do I, Ian Gillespie, yeah. motivate and drive businesses forward? The key for me is to spend time with people. I lived and worked in America for 13 years, and there is a bit of a macho view in America about how early you can get to work. You've heard me talk about this before, Duncan, IQ, OQ, and EQ. Yeah, IQ, everybody knows about your intelligence quotient. It's how well you do on a test, a score. OQ, I describe operational quotient, is about your practical skills. You know, great IQ, you can analyze things to death, but are you able to act on it? Are you able to take that information and process it quickly and efficiently and then act on it? So that's, the, that's your yeah. operational quotient. And then EQ is something that I feel is underrated, which is emotional quotient. Yeah. It, the ability to empathize, the ability to understand, the ability to look at and feel for the other people around you, whether it's a customer, a team member, business owner, as a specific example, if you're looking for private equity investment in your business, for instance, if you're in a, a management buyout, you're sitting across the table from, you know, let's say, let's say you're, you're trying to sell your, your ideas and your business to, to maybe 10 different private equity companies. But you, know, you, you don't do it the same way to all 10 because they're all different. You've got to be aware relatively quickly of you know, what is it that the person that I'm talking to is looking for here. Yeah. And that's about looking at their body language. It's about understanding the questioning techniques that they're using in you and then being able to adapt to that. So it's about having the awareness to think about how the other person is feeling and how they're acting and what they're looking for and then modifying your responses and your behaviors to help that person understand better and to have a better connection with that person. You know, whenever it comes to business leadership, of course, having an IQ, a high IQ is very important. You know, you and I both, Duncan, you know, have, have known people who are really smart. You think, oh boy, that person's really smart. But yeah, you wouldn't have them lead a business in your wildest dreams. Having a good IQ is important, but it needs to be balanced. Mm. Yeah, you, know, you can have a good IQ and a good OQ. In fact, that's a very good combination if you want somebody who's going to just start something up. Yeah, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs can be like that. But for a balanced leadership role, you need to have EQ. I would say for myself, yeah, you know, back to your original question about how do you motivate and drive the team that's forward. You, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I feel I can pick up things quickly. I feel like I'm a very practical person. You know, I've had a couple of businesses that I've been running. They have been healthcare, but they've also been distribution businesses. So, you know, I've spent time out in trucks, you know, riding with drivers. You know, I've spent time in operating theaters, observing uh, kind of work. You've got to be prepared to sort of get in there. That's the, the OQ side. But in terms of driving your team forward, yeah. my last business, I had uh, half a dozen kind of, you know, real key direct reports, and they were all different. And, and I love that. For me, diversity just means, you know, people with differing viewpoints and differing ideas. And I love that. I, I love it. I love having a management team meeting where it's almost a heated debate. I was going to say argument for a second, but a heated debate yes. about, you know, well, you think this, but I think that. And, you know, that is, that's the best way yes. to get people motivated. You've got to feel like you're 
contributing and that you've bought in to the decision-making process yes. that's going to lead the business forward. So it's a bit, like, as you talked before about when you're working with investors, uh, you're flipping it around the other way. When you're dealing with your team, you, you've got to look at them, there's body language, what are they thinking, what are the motivations, because they need to be bought in. Absolutely. I would say for me, what's been most successful, back to what I said before, about taking snippets out of everything I've read and, and understood, people say, well, you should spend you know, time with each of your team members. I do, but not in my office. I spend time with them on a train to Paris for a meeting, on a flight to Amsterdam. You're traveling with them for a half a day. Yeah, why do I need to schedule 45 minutes over a desk with a piece of paper to sort of have a performance review or to, to talk about the direction of the business or to coach or to discuss challenges that I've got with that person or let them discuss challenges that they've got with me? The best places to do that are in those situations where it's much more real. It all comes yeah, out. It yes. Just, it all comes out. Yeah. And, and, you know, I used to say that I would never employ anybody I wouldn't have a drink with. And I would no longer say that because there are lots of people that I would quite happily work with who maybe don't drink anymore or didn't drink or whatever. The idea of that is still valid in my head. Sitting on a train, sitting in a plane, that's the best way to really cut through, you know, the, the, those kind of barriers. It's about using your EQ to connect with people. Yes. And from that, you can then help to motivate them help to understand what you should be doing running and driving the business yep. to help them. And if you get that connection right with your team, and what I'm not saying is you need to be best buddies with everybody. It's very hard. And probably if you are best buddies, with everybody, you've probably made some compromised hiring choices. You've probably hired too many people that are a bit like you. And then you've got a bunch of your mates running a business and that, that can be dangerous. You, you need, Good point. You need, yes, you need challenge. Yeah. You, you absolutely need challenge in a business. But you need to be spending time with everybody so that you've got a clear view on the team, a clear view on what they're thinking, and a, a cohesive direction that you're all moving forward. And, and that, that comes back to my IQ, OQ, EQ. Yeah. If you don't have a balance across all three of those, you're really never going to be particularly successful in the long term. I like to drive businesses forward. I like to look at startup opportunities. But then I like to see it through. You know, I... I'm more of a starter finisher. I want to make sure whenever I leave a business, I've been there long enough that I understand it, that the people understand me, that I've left a mark, that it's you know kind of fully formed. Yes. Rather than sort of you know I'm good at the initial fun stuff and then I'm I, I kind of get bored quickly. And if you've got the right balance of EQ along with IQ and OQ, that's the sweet spot. Yeah. Going back to your real sort of intrinsic motivation, where do you think that's really come from? There's something in there, the way you've got that great balance between the strategic view and really mobilizing people. Where do you think that comes from? It's maybe an Irish thing. Imposter syndrome. I was going to ask about that. You know, I, I grew up in Belfast. I was school smart. So like, you know, so yes. doing well at, at, at school was easy. So I thought, wow, that's an opportunity for me to leave Belfast and uh, that wonder, lust, the travel bug. Yeah. I want to go somewhere else. So, you know, if I did well at school, I would get a free place at university. Wow, that's brilliant. So that, my motivation there was like, okay, well, I find exams pretty easy. So I'll do well at school and then I'll have a choice of where, whatever university I want to go to. And I did. And I picked Manchester, not because of its academic record. I just thought it'd be a good laugh. And I like Manchester United Football Club. Yeah, you know, what I did pick, which was sensible. So this is sort of the balance of sort of like wanting to have a good time and do fun things. I also picked a really good university degree the tagline was, you know, if you want to be a captain of industry, do this course. It was a sort of a, a compressed business studies course with engineering and management. I probably arrived at university a little bit arrogant, thinking, well, look at me with my great A-levels, blah, blah, blah. Yes. But the great thing that happened then, it was like my first week at university, sort of, there was only 20 people on the course. It was bizarre because one of the professors got everybody to stand up and say, who are you? Where are you from? And what did you get in your A-levels? I thought, that's a bizarre thing. I, like, I'm at university now. Who cares? It started off with like, you know, I'm so-and-so from Oxfordshire uh, and I got, you know, four A's and three S1s. So I was like, oops, maybe I'm not as smart as I thought I was. And it, it was a great level. Again, we went around the room and it was like, I'm sitting with all of these really clever people and I feel intimidated. I've always sort of had this little bit, everywhere I've ended up in life, I've thought, why am I here? Like, yes. is, is it real? Uh, waking up in the morning, I need to pinch myself, you know. I went to America in 1992. You know, wow, I was asked if I'd go and kind of set up a, a new business in North America by the chief executive of, of the company who I'd met 
at some evening, and I must have impressed them because I was drinking too much or chatty or something. Yes. And I, yeah, I ended up in America pinching myself, going like, why am I here? Like, when are they going to tell me that they've got the wrong guy and I should be doing something else? And I've sort of, and because of that, because of that sort of self-doubt, I often find, you know, there's a fine line between kind of confidence and arrogance. Yes. And I think I'm self-confident, but I'm always self-questioning. I was very lucky. One of the companies I worked for back in the early part of my career was big into mentoring. And they gave me a mentor. They assigned me this guy uh, called Jim Ford. And Jim Ford was the uh, managing director of BOC in the UK. And he was a Scottish guy with a strong Scottish accent. But God, he was brilliant. You know, like right. a brilliant business guy, but just totally called a spade a spade. And I was just like blown away by this guy. And I learned a lot from him. And I was aware enough, self-aware enough to think, I don't know everything. Yeah, maybe I was a bit self-confident, cocky, maybe in those days. But yeah, I was like, okay, I need to listen. I need to learn from him. Yeah. I was also given the opportunity, because I worked for a big company back at the start, to make mistakes. And that was great as well. Yeah, I was given the freedom to try stuff. And whenever you're young and you're in a management job, yeah. you know, if somebody is second-guessing every decision you make, or if you're being judged on every decision you make, yeah, I worry yeah. about today's world where yes. yeah, everything's you know, social media, everything's being viewed. If you make one wrong decision, you're out, you know? But no, there's, day, a, there's it, a great uh, Simon Sinek quote I, I heard yesterday. It was all about teams. A great team is not a group of people that works together. It's a group of people that trust each other. Ex exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, trust each other to a level that, that allows them to say, I trust the decision that you made. If it's the wrong decision, I yes. still trusted you. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I would have made a different decision, but, you know, it, it was touch and go, and, and that's fine. Being able to make some mistakes in, in the early part of my career, a bit of self-doubt, with coupled with with a high degree of self confidence, because yeah, if you're going to be a leader, you need to be self confident. Yes, let's, let's face it. But you, in a reflective way, you're able to look back and think, "Oh wow, at that point, I was given that to do, and I knew nothing." But there was a little bit of an imposter syndrome going on. But I'm able to reflect on that now. So when I'm in the next situation in my life, you can still go around that loop again. Very much so. And, and as we get older, as we realize, we're all the same people still. We've got more experience, but we're still the same, aren't we? So That's exactly right. And, and maybe linked to that, and very much uh, aligned to it, is that I've had, I had the opportunity to work in each of the various different areas of the business. So yeah, that was the great thing about working for, uh, for a yes. FTSE 100 company. So I, you know, I worked in sales, I worked in business development, I worked yeah, in, in the order to cash process. So if you're going to run a business, you should really know how all of the parts of a business come together. You, yeah. You'd be surprised at the number of people that I've met who wrestle with maybe, you know, the order to cash process. You know, they run a business, but they they don't really understand the importance of you know, kind of cash collection. Yes. You know, money management. Yeah, you know, that's uh, really important. If you're running your own business, you've got to yes. really kind of understand how that works uh, in order to effectively uh, run a business. And, I spent a year doing business process re-engineering. I worked for a big company, and even the guy that gave me the job said, look, I'm sorry, Ian, you're not going to like it, but you've got to take one for the team as part of your career. You know, We've got this big re-engineering project that's going on. I'm going to put you on the team. You're going to run a, it was a sales and operations planning process and a an MRP system implementation. There were three different elements to it that I was supervising and running. And I, I, yeah, I had to deal with a bunch of consultants. Yes. It really frustrated me. But, you know, I, I learned a lot. Yes. And I was I was able to take those experiences as well as the experiences with the people that I've worked with and kind of use them as my toolkit. Let's develop a, a bit further by fast forwarding to your most recent role, uh, mobile healthcare business. If you can give us a brief introduction on what that business was. The interesting thing about that business is you have to make some, there's some pretty big decisions every time you want to take the business forward in terms of the investment required. Sure, yeah. Just introduce the business a little bit. Well, simply, the, you know, we've got a uh, an ever-increasing demand for healthcare in the world. Yes. But certainly in developing countries. Uh, and a, uh, a sort of finite-ish resource or a resource that requires a lot of investment to take forward. And it's also quite fixed. So the, the business that I ran was about mobile healthcare delivery, the ability for the existing infrastructure, people, process, and technology to expand for finite periods of time yeah. at m low to moderate cost in order to peak shave. Because healthcare demand is not linear. It's linear in terms of its growth trajectory, but it's not linear 
it very much has some seasonality to it. So, yes. I, I mean, with COVID, you hear in the, oh, it's the winter, you know, winter pressures on the NHS are very, very bad anyway. Mm. Um, with COVID, therefore, you know, the, the winter is going to be tougher than the summer. Well, how do you gear up for that? How do you manage your capacity within a trust without just building a, a hospital that's twice the size it needs to be yep. in order to cope with that demand. So the business that I was running was uh, mobile healthcare delivery. So we, we would go to uh, an existing healthcare provider and give them the uh, temporary infrastructure to enable them to cope with increased demand for short periods of time. Yeah, it, it could be for a couple of weeks. Yes. More likely it's going to be for a few months. Sometimes... If it's while there's a refurbishment going on or while they're building something new, uh, it could be for several years. But the reality is it's, it, was, it was quickly deployed and enabled uh, existing healthcare providers to, to do more in the same footprint or to expand their footprint. You know, hub and spoke, you, you, could, you could set up a, uh, a community hospital in a car park. Yeah, yeah. Uh, remote from, a, from an existing facility. And these trucks, I've actually set foot in one myself, and they yes. are staggering. It's a complete operating thing. Well, what's interesting, yeah, I mean, the reason I got into the business, I, I was actually invited to go and have a look at one of these units. Yeah, I was doing something else at the time. And I, I literally got a tour oh, okay. uh, from a very clever lady, Mary Smallbone, who was showing me around the unit. I think she was the operations director of the company at the time. And her tour of the unit her enthusiasm for the business and her explanation of how it worked and how it could be a, a fantastic enabler for health systems to treat more people than to be more flexible in terms of they, they handled uh, community care. It blew me away. And I, I then got involved in the business. I ended up buying the business and running it for 10 years. It, it's not just a UK issue. I've been to India. I've been to America, Australia, Canada, looking at the opportunities that all of those countries have got. And of course, everywhere in Europe. Yes, was the thing that got me. This was a uh, a business that sat within a bigger business. It sat within Nuffield. And it was just focused very, very singularly on delivering in the UK, predominantly England. And my head started spinning going, wow, this, you know, this could be a global phenomenon. Yes, yeah. it really changed so, the world. Yeah, yeah. And in, in my tenure at the business, you know, we took the business into, yeah, we developed it in Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland and the south of Ireland across uh, Europe, uh, in the Benelux region, in France, in Germany, in Italy, and then you know, looking to take the business into India. It's currently in Australia. We've actually had a unit in some of the Caribbean islands. If you think about it, an island has got a hospital, typically. Yes. And if that hospital, if the operating theater in that hospital goes down for any reason or it needs to be refurbished, what do you do? Do you, do you fly people somewhere else to get their procedures done? Why not ship in this you know, million pound yes. piece of infrastructure for six months yep. and the health system can run smoothly as, as, it, as it has done? Yeah, yeah. So I get really excited about it. And that's the business that I got involved in. And yeah, the great thing about that business, I've been involved in healthcare. I started getting involved in healthcare in 1990, it would have been 1995, I think, or 1996. Uh, where I was involved in a the development of a, of a drug for uh, PPHM, which is persistent pulmonary hypertension in newborn babies, but or blue baby syndrome, uh, using nitric oxide to to revive babies that are born blue. And and what I've felt in healthcare, because I've I've been engaged in healthcare really since then, is that it's it's a business that can be that be easier to motivate people than others because you feel like you're doing something worthwhile. You know, it, it's great being entrepreneurial and selling widgets to people who want to buy widgets. Yes. Uh, but it's a little bit harder to motivate people if you're doing that. In the business I've been involved in, I've had the added advantage of being involved in a business that's exciting. And the people that work there, they're motivated by business success, salaries, money, and everything else. But they're also motivated by doing something that's exciting and helpful and helps people. Making and I think, a difference. I, th I think that making a difference piece yeah, yeah. is something that's driven me. You ask what, what motivates me. I've tried to be involved in areas of business where I feel like it makes me feel good. You know, people say, why, why are you happy going to work every day? Well, because I love it. That's sort of my attitude to life. If you're going to, I mean, you spend a lot of your life working, so you, you might as well enjoy it. So yeah. pick something that excites you, 
pick something that you care about. And yeah. if you do that, then, you know, your chief executive is going to have an easier job. But then there's a challenge, though, with these trucks. I mean, they look, once you're inside them, they look like spaceships and they cost about the same as spaceships, don't they? So you've got this challenge as a business of as you grow, the investment required is a quantum leap each time. So Very much. So whenever I did the MBO, it was after, yeah, it was 2008, 2009, after the stock market crash. So getting funding, getting capital funding was ridiculous. We had a debt package from a high street bank with very, very restrictive covenants which meant that our ability to build new units was very, very difficult. Yeah, we had to be running at almost 100% capacity before we could build another unit. And getting to that point where everything that you've got, everything that you can sell has been sold already, first of all, it's very difficult to do that. Secondly, if you're bumping up against that point, then you're way too late in building another unit because these units take time. And you're going to start to irritate customers by not having product available. You can't go out selling stuff that you don't have. So, I mean, luckily, the economy in the UK started to recover from the stock market crash. We refinanced and got a better debt package in board, and then we started building. But the decision-making process and, and the board meetings that in my business, we had the you know, kind of our, our formal board meetings every month, the decision to build another unit was always the biggest one. Right. Uh, you know, and that had to be a, you know, we all had to say, yep, we're going to do it. Because once it started, you know, it was a... Uh, you know, six-month process. It was a, a million pound spend. And, you know, there was no going back. And, and yeah, you know, we were at times building kind of four units at a time, five units at a time. And, you know, putting that sort of capital investment into a business is, it can be scary, mm. but it's based on understanding the trajectory of the business that you're running. It's based on understanding the levers, you know, I think you know, one, one thing where analysis is important is in your market. You've got to understand your market. You know, what are the key drivers? What's the market size? What's your share? Is the pie growing? Is it shrinking? Simple business goals. It's simple university stuff. But doing it properly and understanding your business is important. Easy to do in your home market, much more difficult to do for foreign markets. And I think, yeah, that, that, we wrestle with that a little bit. How do you go to India and look at what the opportunity is for uh, you know, mobile healthcare delivery? You know, with tier one cities, is it about hub and spoke? Is it about taking existing brands in tier one cities and putting them in the tier two cities? Yeah, what's your? Is it about the charitable market? Is it about you know? So, so lots of things to wrestle with in a business, uh, and the further you are away from your home market, the more difficult it is. And that brings me back to a point about yeah, you know, my life. And I think yeah, you know, if I'm giving advice to people, which I rarely do because everyone needs to sort of find their own way in life. Mm. But yeah, people should travel. Yeah, I've had the opportunity of living and working in different countries. I spent 13 years uh, working in America. I've ran you know, kind of Canada and South American businesses. I've had global roles where I've had responsibility for uh, businesses in different parts of the world. I think whenever I went to the States in 2002 to do a new business launch, I made so many mistakes because I thought America was going to be the same as the UK. It's not. You've got to have that uh, clarity to say, whenever I go to some a new market, I've got to understand that market. I've got to try and understand the people. I've got to understand the process, the technology, and it's going to be different. So again, if you're looking to try and drive a business forward, and part of that growth strategy is international development, Yes, you can bring in the right expertise at times. Yeah. Don't be afraid to do that. I'm not a fan of bringing in big consultancy companies for a year, but you know, bring in specific expertise for specific issues that you're dealing with and kind of use that information wisely. So what's the one thing you'd like to leave with us today, um, whether it be in a leadership role as a CEO or as a leader, as an individual contributor? The immediate thing that comes to mind when you ask that question is to understand that there isn't just one way of doing things. You know, and you may not have the same solution as the person next to you. Yep. You may feel like you need to do a bit more analysis than somebody else, but that's okay. You've got to tailor. Yeah, we're all individuals and you've got to, yeah, first of all, look for a business that suits you. Look for a role that suits you. You know, a marketeer or an accountant or a, you know, a salesman, a salesman or, or a product manager, they're all different roles. They all require different 
skill set. I still would suggest strongly that they all you know, look at their IQ, OQ, and EQ. Yes. Everybody should do a bit of stare, stare in the mirror and reflect on that and think about where they're strongest and where they're weakest and maybe spend a little bit of time doing that. Just understand that, that you're your own person. Have a bit of confidence, a bit of self-confidence to say, let's, let's give it a go. If you fail, you've learned something. And I think that's the really important thing. I think you know, too many people try and fit in. Don't spend all of your life trying to be a square peg in a round, a yes. round hole. Just surround yourself with the right people. That's the best advice I've ever had. Hire somebody that, that you think, I could work for that person. Yes. You know? Never hire somebody you think good, you know, they'll be a good employee. Hire somebody you think, that person could be my boss one day. I've always tried to hire the best person possible. What's the best way of reaching out to you, Ian, to make contact? Yeah, the best way for people to contact me is just email. And that's, yeah, know, yeah. I'm old fashioned that way. You know, okay, yeah. well, it's been great to talk to you today. Thanks very much, Ian. Thanks, Duncan. It's been great. Really enjoyed it. This podcast series is produced by Mark Gardner and Catherine Cunning at Oxford Sound Studios, Oxford, UK.